Good morning, church. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name's Ray. I'm here to give us the uh, Bible reading this morning. Um, so this morning's Bible reading comes from Matthew 24. Matthew 24. Hi, good morning, church. Um, my name is Ray, here to give the Bible reading this morning, uh, and we're going for Matthew 24, starting from verse 1. Uh, let's just pray for just a sec. Um, dear Heavenly Father, I'd like to uh, just pray for uh, Pastor Felix, who's about to uh, give us the sermon. I just pray, Father, that you would uh, work and uh, speak um, powerfully through, through uh, Pastor Felix. Uh, by your Holy Spirit, Father, I pray also that uh, we too will be able to listen uh, humbly, um, listen expectantly, uh, and listen obediently as well. Uh, in Jesus' name, amen. Um, so Matthew 24, verse 1. Jesus left the temple and was walking away when his disciples came up to him to call his attention to its buildings. Do you see all these things, Jesus asked? Truly, I tell you, not one stone will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. Tell us, they said, when will this happen? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Jesus answered, watch out that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, claiming I am the Messiah, and will deceive many. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars, and see to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen, and the end is still to come. Nations, nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against nation. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of birth pains. Then you will be hand, handed over to be persecuted and, to, and put to death, and you will be hated by all nations because of me. At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. And many prophets will appear and deceive many people. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. And this, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all the nations, and then the end will come. So when you see... So when you see standing in the holy place the abomination that causes desolation spoken of through the prophet Daniel, let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let the one who let the one on the roost, rooftop go down to uh, let let no one on the rooftop go down to take out from the house, and let no one in the field go back to get their cloak. How dreadful it will be in those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers. Pray for your flight, pray that your flight will not take place in winter or on the Sabbath. For then there will be great distress, unequaled from the beginning of the world until now, and, and never to be equaled again. If those days had not been cut short, no one would survive. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be shortened. At that time, if anyone says to you, look, here is the Messiah, or there he is, do not believe it, for, most, for false messiahs and false prophets will appear and perform great signs and wonders, to, and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. See, I have told you in advance. So if anyone tells you, there he is, out in the desert, do not go out. Or, here he is, in the inner rooms, do not believe it. For as lightning comes from the east and is visible in the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Wherever, when, wherever there is a carcass, there the vultures will gather. Immediately after those, the distress of those days, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the sky, and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. Then will appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then all peoples of the earth will mourn when they see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a loud trumpet call and will gather his elect from the four winds from one end of heavens to the other. Now learn this lesson from the fig tree. As soon as its twigs become tender and its leaves come out, you know that summer is near. Even so, when you see all these things, you know that it is near, right at the door. Truly I tell you, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will not pass away, but my heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. This is God's word. Thank you. 
Thanks, Ray, for the Bible reading. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's great to see you all here. A special welcome, particularly if you're new or you're visiting us today. It's great to have you with us. Now, one conversation that I've had in the past that I think I'll never forget uh, is one that I had with a colleague um, over one lunchtime many, many years ago. Because my colleague revealed that he had a secret bunker out way in the west of Sydney uh, preparing for the end of the world. Uh, see, I, I had only heard about doomsday preppers from reading the news or watching ads or flicking through channels on TV. I'd never imagined that I actually knew someone who was a doomsday prepper. Uh, and as he continued to talk about how convinced he was at that time that the world was going to end in 2012 because of all these different factors, the Mayan calendar and all that sort of stuff, uh, he kept talking about how his bunker was stocked full of uh, water that was wetter than normal water. I still have no idea what that means to this day. Uh, and him refusing to disclose the location of his secret bunker so that we all won't go flooding to his place come the apocalypse. I remember the reaction of all my colleagues around the lunch table. They weren't very subtle about how they thought of him. They thought he was a bit silly, to say the least. And at the time, I just remember being stunned. I was like, wow, you exist. Uh, in my mind, I, I too was thinking, this guy was wasting his time and his money building his elaborate bunker. But the question we have to face today is, is it actually wrong to be preparing for the end of the world? Because if we listen to Jesus' words in this passage today, he is actually helping us to know how to prepare for the end. He is teaching us how to be a prepper, in a way. Uh, but spoiler alert, our application today won't be to go off and build a secret bunker somewhere. Uh, but as we get into this te text, let's, let, let's just remember the context. Uh, uh, sorry, as we get into this text, let, let's just make a brief note. This passage is a highly controversial one, isn't it? Uh, there are so many different views uh, about the timing and the details of this, and I simply just won't have time to cover it. Uh, but as I walk through the text, of course, I'll be bringing one interpretation on this passage. But one thing I hope will be clear by the end of today is that the overall message, what Jesus wants all of us to take away, it should be clear regardless of what view you take. Even if you disagree with some of how I interpret some of the details, I think it's really clear how Jesus wants us to walk away from this passage. And so let's get into it then. Uh, Jesus, from last week, he's already come into the temple as the triumphant king, riding the donkey, uh, fulfilling the prophecies of the Old Testament. But more importantly, Jesus shows himself to actually smash all the expectations. He actually is the humble king, the revolutionary king. He is a sacrificial king. In all the bits that we skipped over, Jesus was confronted with the religious leaders of the temple as they try to trap Jesus in his words, and they fail miserably. And so when it looks like Jesus has now won all these skirmishes, he's shown himself to be worthy of the authority that he claims for himself, Jesus and his disciples are now walking away from the temple. And what we see first is that the disciples, they... They look at their temple, they, they draw attention to it. It's one of the grandest buildings of the ancient world, and they must have been impressed by it. Maybe they're thinking, wow, look at how awesome the temple of our God is. But notice what Jesus says. Do you see all these things, he asks? Truly, I tell you, not one stone here will be left on another. Every one of these will be thrown down. Now, with a statement like this, he's not simply saying, oh, what a shame it will be when this great, magnificent building will be thrown down. But the disciples knew exactly what Jesus meant, because far greater than simply a building falling down, the destruction of the temple meant the end of the worship of God in the eyes of the disciples, right? In the, in the eyes of the Jews, that's what it meant. Where would we sacrifice to God? 
Where will we meet to celebrate all our festivals, to celebrate God as God's people? Uh, in, in, in the Old Testament, even in our last series, we saw that the destruction of the first temple, this is the second temple, by the way, the first temple was destroyed as a sign that God would no longer dwell with his people, that God had abandoned his people, at least for a time. And so now, after all these years with the temple being rebuilt over many, many decades of it finally being completed, to say that this temple is going to be destroyed again, it could only mean one thing. No more temple means it must be the end. Right? The end of this existence as the Jews understood it. Maybe it's a climax that we read about in Isaiah when all the nations are gathered against God's people, culminating in the destruction of God's holy temple. And if that's it, the book of Isaiah also predicts that that would also be the time when God's kingdom would be established, when God's rule will be clear for all to see, where God's king would finally come in victory as the triumphant king. No more opposition to start the king's everlasting reign over the world. This is all rolling in the disciples' minds at the moment. And so the question is an obvious one, right, for, for the disciples. When will this happen, Jesus? When's the temple going to be destroyed? When, when's the, when, when is the end really going to come? When are you going to come truly with triumphant victory? But Jesus doesn't actually answer that question immediately. Uh, the first thing Jesus says is, watch out. Watch out that no one deceives you. Uh, because many will come claiming to be Jesus. Uh, coming, claiming to be the the miraculous saviour of the world, the people of God, and might even claim to be the king of the world. Uh, a title that only Jesus can claim, right? That's a strange thing to start the answer with. Why do they need to watch out for this? Well, it's because of what is to come. Wars, rumours of wars, kingdoms rising and falling in battle, natural disasters even, famines, and earthquakes. And it's natural. It's natural for us to think that the world is coming to an end when we hear about wars on an epic scale, right? Famines and natural disasters. Uh, sometimes when we hear about the rising political tension between international superpowers, uh, when we read our news feeds and they're inundated with tsunamis in Japan, uh, firestorms in the US, earthquakes, even in Melbourne, uh, and even with the, the outbreak of COVID last year, we often people, hear people say, the end must be near. I wonder if you thought so yourself. But maybe surprisingly, Jesus tells us how we are to think of these events. They are simply the beginning of birth pains. A vivid memory that I have was uh, when Sarah was in labor with our first daughter, uh, our first child, Beth. She was already several hours into this long, agonizing proce process. She was exhausted after wave after wave of the contractions and the pain. And she was like, oh, can you bring the nurse in? I want to know how much, how much progress I've made. And I remember the nurse coming in, and she just took a quick look and said, nope, not even halfway yet. Labor is a long, hard process. And Jesus uses this illustration for us to, to, to wake us up, to, to help us to think that as bad as things might be getting, we need to be prepared that this is just the beginning of a long, drawn-out upheaval. But that's not it. It gets worse, particularly for those of us who are Christians, because not just will there be troubles on a global level, but in particular, the church, the people who follow Jesus, they will suffer greatly. Persecution will be heavy, even to the point of death. Followers of Jesus will be hated by all nations because of Jesus, right? That, that last bit is clear, because of Jesus. We're not talking about when the church stuffs up, child abuse scandals, 
when celebrity, celebrity pastors have a shameful fall from grace, or even non-celebrity pastors when they abuse their authority. We're not talking about that. But this persecution will come because of Jesus. Because the church is living exactly as Jesus told the church to live. Being the salt and light of the earth, upholding righteousness, calling out the evil in the world, and proclaiming the gospel. Jesus says, if you live according to how I tell you to live, persecution will come. And in fact, the pressure will be so great, so intense, the persecution will be so great that Christians will even betray and hate one another. Because of how severe, how unrelenting this attack will be, the love of most will grow cold. It's a sobering thought, isn't it? Maybe it's despair that they've lost all hope. Maybe it's cynicism creeping in. Maybe it's just a a simple desperation to preserve their earthly lives. But whatever the reason might be, Jesus tells us that many who follow him will no longer have the will to hold on to their love. They will let go of their love for the brothers and sisters in Christ, the love of God's gospel. They will let go of their love for Jesus himself. But there is hope here. There is hope here in the final verse, verse 13. Those who stand firm to the end will be saved. And we see this throughout the scriptures, right? God always has been preserving a faithful remnant who won't compromise, who who will persevere till the end despite all the hardships and all the trials. What a wonderful promise that is. And so we have all these great upheavals on the world stage, wars, famines, earthquakes, but that won't be the end. We have heavy, sustained persecution on the church, but that won't be the end either. So when will it be? Well, it looks like finally Jesus is sort of getting to the heart of the question now. Verse 15, So when you see standing in the holy place the abomination that causes desolation, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Now, for those of us who were with us last year when we looked at the book of Daniel, our ears should be pricking up right now, right? Because this this reference to the abomination that causes desolation, it was what the prophet Daniel predicted would happen during the time before Jesus came about one particular king, a Greek king, Antiochus IV. Because this king hated the Jews so much, hated God so much, not only did he try to outlaw sacrifice to Israel's God, but most horrific of all, he offers a pig, an unclean animal, on God's holy altar. An animal that shouldn't even come anywhere near the temple. It can't even be eaten by God's holy people. But for this king, Antiochus IV, it was meant to be the most shocking, most disrespectful, most disgusting thing he could think of to spit in the face of God. And Jesus is now saying, using this reference, say, when you see a similar event happening soon, when God himself is blasphemed, mocked, spat on by God's enemy in a totally shocking way, then you know the time has come. It's time to flee. There's not even time to grab your cloak. Don't don't even go back to your house to get your family memories or treasures. When that time comes, run for your lives. That's how sudden and how terrible that situation is. It's so bad that Jesus says it will be the greatest distress the world has ever seen and will ever see. And only now, after all this, does Jesus start talking about his return. When we read these descriptions, these quotations from the book of Isaiah here, right? The sun darkened, the stars falling from the sky. It's not simply an astronomical observation, but it's one of cosmic significance because judgment is coming upon the earth. God is coming with power to judge the earth. And what does Jesus say will happen alongside this judgment? Well, Jesus will now appear. And when the king appears, the people of the earth will mourn. 
they will know that the time of judgment have come upon them. What they have done to God's people, God will now set straight in his books. But the elect, God's chosen people, the ones who belong to Christ their King and the ones who have stand, have stood firm in their faith till the end, they will be gathered up for God. But I don't know if you've noticed, after all this, Jesus still hasn't answered the question yet. Because remember, what, what, what is the question? The question is, when? When will it happen? Well, Jesus simply tells us to look, look at the signs and then we'll know, right? He tells us to look at a, a fig tree and know when summer is coming. Now, when, when I was studying at Bible college, there was this beautiful jacaranda tree in the middle of the courtyard. Uh, but when the tree started blossoming, when it started showing its purple flowers, not only was it a beautiful sight to look at, but it would fill the students with dread. Do you know why? Final exams were coming and they had to start studying, right? The purple flowers were a sign of what was to come, that they had to act. So Jesus says, pay attention to all these signs that I've just told you. Wars, disasters, persecution, a great distress that keeps getting worse each time, one after another. You think nothing has been this bad before. Keep an eye out for these signs, and then you will know that the time has come. You need to act. And when will all these signs be fulfilled? Well, Jesus, I think, gives us a very surprising answer. Truly, I tell you, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. And so when will all these events happen? When will all these conditions to be met before Christ will come back be fulfilled? The answer that Jesus gives us here is within the same generation of his first hearers, his disciples. That is to say, Jesus is saying within the lifetime of his disciples standing there on the Mount of Olives, within their lifetime, they will see all the necessary signs to be fulfilled, completed. Or to put it in another way, be ready for Christ to come even in your lifetime. The season is now. The fig tree is ripe. The jacaranda tree is purple. But wait a second. Uh, Felix, didn't you just say that we aren't to be alarmed by world-shattering events, that Jesus will take a long time to, to come back and be prepared for a big delay? Uh, now you're saying that Jesus can come at any moment? Uh, but for, for those of us who have studied Matthew in our life groups, this isn't anything new, isn't it? Is it? Because in the following chapters, Jesus will double down on this as we look at the different parables, seemingly paradoxical at first. One parable says, make sure you, you keep watch. You don't know when the thief is going to come. But another one says, you need to make sure you have enough oil waiting for the bridegroom. It, it, it seems contradictory. But there's a, there's a very important tension here that we need to be prepared either way whether Jesus comes back tomorrow or, or there'll be a long, long drawn-out process. And so Jesus explains what's going on here. Why do we have to be so prepared? Verse 36. But about that day or hour, no one knows. Not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, not even Jesus himself, but only the Father, right? For the disciples, this is, you must have imagined, this must have been a very disappointing answer. They wanted a precise answer. When is it going to happen? Give us a date so we can prepare. I wonder if this is a disappointing answer for you. If you ask the question to Jesus, when are you going to come back? But the answer that he gives is simply that no one knows. Only God the Father knows. Now, that's the end of... Uh, the exegesis, the ex going through the parable, uh, the, 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 the text. I, I'm sure that many of you have been feeling like you've been drinking from a fire hose of, as I've really rushed through this passage. And I haven't even gone into detail yet, right? You, you could read entire books just unpacking this very chapter. 
But let's try to make sense of all this. Let's go back to the disciples' question. And the original question is this. Tell us, Jesus, they said, when will all this happen? And, and what is this? This is the destruction of the temple. That, that's actually what started this whole question and this whole section in the first place. When will this happen? When will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Th those are the three parts to the question, right? Temple destroyed, end of the age, Jesus is coming. And so let's recap Jesus' answer. Uh, first, you have to expect a delay. And so don't panic when there's wars or, or, and natural disasters. Don't panic when you suffer heavy persecution. Uh, second, there will be one climactic great distress. At that time, God's name will be profaned in an outrageous way. The persecution of God's people will climax to a never-seen-before stage and severity. But then judgment will come. Christ will return and God's people will be gathered up. And that time, no one will know when that will come. And of course, all that is needed for this to be fulfilled will happen within the very lifetimes of the original disciples. Now, the original question was very simple, wasn't it? When will the temple be destroyed? When will you return? When will the end come? But looking at this answer, you might be thinking, what on earth? Uh, first of all, you might have so many questions, uh, raising more questions and answers here. I mean, let's just consider the first part of the question. The first part of the question was, when was, would the temple be destroyed? And now looking at Jesus' answer, the, the temple isn't even mentioned here explicitly. Or does he? Because if we look a bit closer, I think Jesus does answer that question for them. Uh, because that's most likely what Jesus was referring to in verse 15, the abomination that causes desolation. Because what's more shocking than even a pig being sacrificed on God's altar? Well, isn't it that the temple coming tumbling down because of an enemy? And so then it looks like the destruction of the temple is this great distress that Jesus is talking about. But then we have another problem. Because now, with, the, with, with, with hindsight, we, if we look at the timing of what Jesus is laying out here, it looks as if Jesus is saying that after the temple is destroyed, that if that is the great distress, then Jesus comes back immediately. But when we look back at history, that's of course not what happens. Because the temple was destroyed by the Roman Empire in 70 AD. But look, it's been almost 2,000 years now and Jesus still hasn't come back. And so what, what's going on there? But there are some signs even in this passage that Jesus is pointing to something even more than simply the destruction of the temple here, right? When we read these verses, we can see that Jesus' description goes beyond that event in 70 AD. Because he says that the great distress will be unequaled from the beginning of the world until now, never to be equaled again. That if in those days, the days had not been cut short, no one would survive. That, that, these, these are truly world-ending descriptions of what Jesus is saying here. Uh, and now, by, by all accounts, the, the destruction of the, 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 the temple, the siege of Jerusalem by, by the Romans, that was a devastating time, right? Josephus claims that over a million Jews were killed during the siege because it was the Passover and all the Jews were, were, were gathering and celebrating at the temple. Uh, close to 100,000 were captured and made slaves of many thousands, even made into gladiators to fight to the death. It was brutal for the Jews. But the way that Jesus describes this event here, distress never to be equaled again, that points us actually further along to events that are even more tragic and more horrific than the events of 70 AD. Instead, what I think is happening is here that the des destruction of the temple is the first of its kind, a pattern, a template for the true great distress that will unfold in the age to come, or in, in this age. 
And so Jesus is, is still answering the disciples' question about the temple. He is sort of talking about the temple, but he's simply using this as a launch pad to look into what it will be like to live in the last days. Because when we look at the last 2,000 years, we do see other events, right, that might rightly be labelled as abominations that causes desolation. I'm sure the first one that comes to your mind would be the Holocaust, right? Six million Jews who were murdered, murdered, tortured during the Holocaust, during World War II. And so if this is right, this means that there awaits a time when there will be even a greater suffering and persecution that will arise. And I think ultimately, once we get this, that leads us to what Jesus is really on about as he answers the disciples' question. Because he's not interested in timing. The disciples care about timing. I, I think many of us would be interested in timing. When are you coming back? But for Jesus, there's a far more important question, something that we need to know. And that is, Jesus wants us to know what to expect in the last days before he returns. Because as we've been seeing all along in, in Matthew, having the right expectations, that is so important, isn't it? Because what's the danger? What's the danger if we don't have the right expectations? Well, actually, Jesus tells us over and over again here. Did you notice that? Even from the beginning, Jesus keeps repeating, make sure you are not deceived. Right? Why will we, we be deceived? Because many false prophets will appear during, during these tumultuous times. Why does Jesus need to warn, warn us of this? Well, it's precisely because the end of, because this age will have many, many earth-shattering events. From now until Jesus' return, history will be characterized by heavy persecution, by his followers being tortured and put to death. And with all this upheaval, false prophets will lure God's people into thinking the time is, is coming, the end is near, and they will try to seduce God's people, thinking that they are the Messiah to bring his people out of it. With all the persecution and suffering, false Christ will come offering a false gospel, a false hope, false peace to lead astray God's people who are worn down and they're just sick of suffering. They can't take it anymore. And so Jesus says, I am telling you in advance what is happening so you can look out for false prophets. Look out for messages that don't line up with what I've been telling you. Praying on the fears of, the, of, of God's people and turning away from the truths of the gospel. Watch out. And even when we get to the final distress, that great moment just before Jesus comes, Jesus is saying, even that, be warned. Do not be deceived, because even then can God's people be deceived by false claims, false messiahs. And so how do we know then? If Jesus keeps saying, be, be careful, don't be deceived, then how do we know when Jesus actually comes? Well, thankfully, Jesus tells us, when Jesus comes, we won't need to be told by someone through the grapevine. You're not going to read about it on Reddit. He won't appear on some obscure place somewhere out in the bush or on some remote island. Jesus isn't going to appear in someone's basement, right? When Jesus comes back, you will know. Everyone will know. There will be no more questions about it. See, Jesus tells us beforehand so we know what to expect. Don't be deceived. Don't be swayed by these people claiming to be messiahs or, or, or a new special prophet bringing a message that is contrary to the gospel. Don't be swayed even by miracles, Jesus says, wonders, because a time is coming when there will be someone coming with spectacular miracles, but don't actually follow Jesus' words. Keep holding on to Jesus' words. Let that be your true guide even when things get hard when things get crazy. But there's also another reason why we need to have the right expectations of the times that we're living in now. And that is, I think we need to be prepared that Christ's return might be more delayed than we think. Now, this might be a really odd thing for you to hear. I mean, it's 2020. 
sorry, 2021. Uh, this church has been waiting for Christ's return for two millennia now. Uh, and, and when you think about it, when you read these passages, you might think, we need, we need to be warned of Christ's imminent return. And I think you're absolutely right there. And in our life groups, I think we've already covered all of that. I think in our life groups, we've talked through what it means to be prepared for Christ to come back any time, at any moment. But just because that is true, it doesn't mean that we don't need to hear Christ's warning about anticipating an extended return. And that's what I want to talk about a bit more today. Because I, I do want to argue that we are people who actually really need to hear Jesus' warning that his return might be delayed. Because I think we are people who would panic, who, would be, who might be deceived if there is a long, drawn-out process of suffering, of great distress. Uh, it, it's no surprise for me to tell you, I'm sure, that we are living very comfortably as Christians right here in Brisbane, Australia. We're, we're free from the heavy persecution that has been characteristic of God's people throughout history, right? Just take a brief look at any history of the church and see page after page, centuries after centuries of bloodshed, of violent persecution of those who follow Jesus. Even today, just look online. Beyond our national borders, we don't have, we don't have to go too far before we land ourselves in a place where Christians are hated for following Jesus, where churches are burned down, where Christians are targeted on purpose and unspeakable horrors are done against them. Right here in Brisbane, Australia, I think it's easy to think, to be deceived into thinking that being a Christian is easy. And I wonder that whether or not as a church, as a whole people of God here, that we just aren't prepared for when heavy persecution eventually comes. Or when truly earth-shattering global events really hit us. Even take COVID, right? We've been so sheltered from the full brunt of COVID when we look around, around the world. That when these things happen, even if our theology, right? We, we, we pride ourselves in our strong theology, our, our discernment when it comes to being swayed by false gospels, right? Uh, the prosperity gospel or whatever it might be. Even if that's true, I think we are still in danger of being swayed. Oh, sorry. I think we still are in danger of our love growing cold when the going gets really tough. What would it look like for us to be ready? Well, are you ready for our tremendous wealth and affluence to be stripped away? We're so used to enjoying this, the abundant blessings that God has given us materially that I don't think we're prepared to face the sudden loss to all our wealth if it comes one day. I'm, I'm including myself in that. I'm enjoying so much material blessing that I have to stop and really think about, am I prepared for when that day comes? Are you ready for family relationships to be torn apart when holding on to core gospel principles and truths that one day might become a point of tension for family and friends? Are you ready to go to prison, even die for Christ, before you would consider renouncing Jesus as Lord? And are we actively preparing for what Jesus says is actually the normal Christian experience right now, right? Are we already living today as if the things that we possess in our lives are temporary, that we could lose them at any moment? It can be taken away from us at any moment. Are we living like that now already in the way that we plan, in the way that we make decisions? Are we actively working to let go of things that, that tempt us to follow Jesus wholeheartedly and serving Jesus as King? Are we training ourselves, preparing ourselves to be bold, to live for Jesus now while it's easy before things get hard? Are we investing in things that will last into eternity and not waiting until we feel like things are getting really urgent before we start doing that? Here's another one. Are we preparing our, our, our hearts and our minds with God's word 
and what he's, reve he's revealed to us about this age that we are living in? Or, or do we turn away from the, the tricky passages in the Bible because it's too hard, it's too controversial? Do we study passages like Matthew 24 or the book of Revelation because that gives us a good understanding of what God is giving us to prepare for the end? Are we doing that? Are you finding your true security and safety in the King right now who will ultimately preserve our lives for the age to come? Now, I've, I've listed a lot of things here. But the truth of it is, that's quite simple, isn't it? That's just living the Christian life. That's just following Jesus as king. But that's the thing. It's not rocket science. That's all it is for our love not to be cold, for us to prepare for what is to come. It's to set our hearts right, to practice living for Jesus right now before things get tough. That's all it is. And when you really think about it, what I've just listed there, that's actually no different than if I said, how are you going to prepare for Christ's imminent return? If Christ was going to come any time, how would you live? What's well, the same, isn't it? Being rooted in Christ to actually take your faith seriously, to follow Jesus seriously, no matter Jesus, whether Jesus is going to come back tomorrow or if Jesus is going to take a long return and there's going to be a long period of suffering, how are you going to survive both scenarios? It's exactly the same. Take your faith seriously. Listen to Jesus. Listen and live with Jesus as your king. That's all it is. If we want to prepare well for the end, if you want to be a faithful Christian doomsday prepper, that's all there is to it. There's nothing new. It's what we've heard from Jesus throughout the series on Matthew this year. It's what we've heard from the book of Isaiah as we're told to throw away our idols, to behold our God, to not put our trust in human power, but to trust in God alone. But here's the thing. As we've been filling our ears and our heads with the words of God, how are we actually going in listening, truly listening, and allowing God's word to change our hearts, to change our lives. When was the last time you actually changed your behavior because you were convicted by God's word? When was the last time when you read your Bible by yourself, your quiet time, and you didn't just go, thank you, close the book and go to bed? When was the last time you actually sacrificed something that you once held dear because you realized that it hindered your relationship with God? Because this is what preparing for the end looks like, friends. What do our answers to these questions tell us about whether we're wise in preparing for Christ's return or that we actually don't think it's important? Because Jesus is so clear. When we look at these verses, it, it's truly scary, isn't it? What, what Jesus paints, the picture that Jesus paints. But Jesus isn't trying to scare us. Jesus tells us plainly what to expect out of love because he's told us all these things so that we might not be people who are deceived. We might not be people who panic, deceived by false messiahs, panicking so that our, our love might grow cold, so that we can't say when, when suffering and persecution comes that, Jesus, this is, what I, this is not what I signed up for. You never told me it would be this hard. But Jesus tells us these things so that we can be the ones who stand firm to the end and be saved. And so let us be prepared as we wait for Christ to return. Let us be those who are prepping, training ourselves so that our love won't grow cold when the going gets tough. Let's pray. Father in heaven, as we come to you as a, our Lord, the, the Lord of all history, the one with history written out already in your books about what is to come, we thank you that you have shown us a picture of what to expect so that we might not be deceived. Father Lord, we, we thank you that even in all the 
uh, horrific events that you, you, you paint for the future, for even for this current age that we are living in, we thank you that you are still in control. We thank you for your promise that those who cling on to you, who stand firm with our faith, trusting in Jesus to deliver us, that you will bring those of us to safety. So we pray, Lord, help us to be people who, who, who listen to your words wisely and, and seriously. Help us to be people who will be preparing day by day to be living for your sake, to be preparing for hard times ahead, even now when things are not so hard, that we, we may persevere till the end and see you face to face on that final day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.